If you would turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 1. My subject on this beautiful Easter morning is he holds the keys. Easter is the proof. He holds the keys. He's got the key to your life. He's got the key for fragmented, broken pieces. He's got the key, and he's the answer for all of your problems. He holds the keys, and Easter is the proof. John was on the isle that is called Patmos, and he was there because he had preached the word of God, and John had been banished to this lonely island, this lonely piece of real estate because of his testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And while John was on this lonely island, he came face to face with the risen, resurrected Lord of glory. This was the same Jesus that he had seen open blinded eyes. This is the same Jesus that he had seen raise the dead. He had seen him cleanse the leper. He had seen him offer forgiveness to the sinner. This is the same Jesus that John saw nailed to the tree, crucified on the cross, and placed in a borrowed tomb. John had later seen the empty tomb, and John had seen Jesus after he was resurrected in his appearances for 40 years days as he came and went out among the people. But in my text, John saw Jesus, John felt Jesus, and John heard Jesus. Maybe you're feeling something this morning that you have never felt before in all of your life. That is Jesus, and he is here in the form of the Holy Spirit. And he's walking up and down the golden candlesticks of his church and he is here to bless people, to heal people, to save people, and to do the miraculous. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you could ever ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, the church. Now, John is on this lonely island, and he comes face to face with Jesus once again. Look at Revelation 1.17. Listen to it. John said, and when I saw him, he said, I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Then he said, he laid his right hand upon me, so he felt Jesus. Saying unto me, fear not, I am the first and the last. So he saw Jesus, he felt Jesus, and he heard Jesus. What did Jesus say? He said, I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. You know, the devil doesn't even have the key to his own home. Jesus stripped him of his power, made a show of him openly, triumphed over him, and gave the keys of the kingdom to the church. We're kingdom people, and we're to rule and reign in life as kings and priests unto God. We're not to be ruled over by the devil and the forces of darkness. We are to rule and reign and take our position in Christ and rise up in the resurrection power that you're feeling and sensing here in the church today. But today I want to talk to you about he holds the keys and Easter is the proof. The resurrection, that's what we're celebrating. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for all the songs that have been sung for the the young people, our teens, Lord, for every person that is gathered here. Lord, those that came because they have been called by the Spirit to this particular service. And Lord, some people don't even realize why I'm here today. But Lord, you have directed their footsteps. Now, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me and then fall fresh upon this congregation Lord, let me preach the gospel with the Holy Ghost power sent down from heaven. Give us all a listening ear, and everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Josh McDonald, in his book, More Than a Conqueror, he explores two types of truths. First of all, there is scientific proof. And then secondly, there is legal historical proof. Scientific proof is based on showing something that it is a fact by repeating that event in a, control, in a controlled environment where observations are made, data is taken, and a hypothesis is verified. The other method of truth is 
legal historical proof. And it's based on showing something that is beyond a reasonable doubt based on oral or written testimony and other supporting evidence. Now, the scientific method can only be used to prove things that are repeatable. It is not adequate for pr proving or disproving per uh, proving questions about persons, events, and things that happen in history. The scientific method cannot be used to prove such things as whether George Washington was the first president of the United States of America, or whether Christopher Columbus discovered America, or who was Jesus of Nazareth. These questions lie outside the realm of scientific proof. And we must rely solely, totally, and completely upon legal historical proof to explain and verify these truths. When the New Testament was written, the apostles and the other disciples, they spoke and they wrote as eyewitnesses to the events that they described. The disciples, when they saw Jesus crucified on that cross, they thought it was all over. When he was arrested, they ran and they hid for fear of the Jews. And when they later were told that the tomb was empty and the stone had been rolled away and Jesus was not there, they did not believe it. It was after the convincing evidence of his resurrection that they believed. Amen. Amen. Peter denied the Lord several times during the trial. And he was so full of fear that he ran and deserted Jesus. But something happened to Peter on the day of Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter showed up in Jerusalem preaching boldly under the threats of death that Jesus was the Christ and that Jesus had been crucified and resurrected. Peter witnessed his Lord's resurrection. And he believed to the extent that he was willing to die and give his life for his testimony and his belief. Now, while Jesus was growing up, his earthly uh, brother there, James, the brother of Jesus, he did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. James must have felt humiliated. Think about it. His brother made such claims as, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Or Jesus made this claim, said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Except you abide in me, and I abide in you, you can bear no fruit at all. Or take this one. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. But something happened to James. Something happened that made him believe. Because after Jesus was crucified and buried and resurrection, resurrected, James became a preacher of the gospel. Think about these people, eyewitnesses that were willing to give their lives to preach the glorious everlasting gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that was Saul. Saul was the man who was out killing Christians. He had papers under his arm. But something happened to him. He became the great apostle Paul. He was violently opposed to the Christian faith because of the importance that he attached to the law as the way of salvation. He said, you got to do this and you got to do that and you can't do this and you can't do that. But he had a glorious Damascus Road experience where he met Jesus Christ, hallelujah. He had papers, thank you. He was out with papers under his arms arresting Christians. But he had that experience where he saw Jesus and he heard him. And he said, who is it, Lord? He was knocked to the ground. He knew who it was. Jesus told him, said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. It's hard for you to go against what I'm doing, Paul. And he talks to him, and Paul becomes a great preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. His life was changed forever. And instead of Paul the persecutor, he became Paul the preacher. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he preached this gospel wherever he went. Amen. I want you to listen to his own testimony. 
Listen to what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's known as the resurrection chapter. I'm beginning to read in verse 3. Paul said, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He was seen of Cephas, or Peter, then of the twelve. And after that, he was seen of 500 brethren at once, and the greater part remain unto this day, but some of them, they've fallen asleep. They've already died. Amen. And last of all, Paul said, he was seen of me also as one that was born out of due time. See, the resurrection is no myth. The Easter bunny is a myth. But the resurrection is a legal, historical, documented fact. Jesus Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now think about it. If there is no resurrection, then we are wasting our time by being here today. If there is no resurrection, then I am wasting my time by preaching. If there is no resurrection, you are wasting your time by listening to me today and we all ought to be doing something else. If there is no resurrection, our preaching is vain, it is futile, it is worthless, it is of no profit if Jesus Christ is still in the grave. But I've got good news. Jesus Christ is alive. It is a historical, documented, legal fact, and he lives, and because he lives, we also shall live. Glory to God. Now, I told this story several years ago about Harry Houdini. If you remember Harry Houdini, it, it marks your age. Amen. <laughs> so, young people, I want to tell you who Harry Houdini was. Amen. His claim to fame was he was a magician, and he specialized in spectacular escapes. They said that, oh, Harry had the flexibility of an eel. Like a cat, he was said to have had nine lives. They did all types of things to confine old Harry. They sealed him in a coffin, he escaped. They riveted him into a boiler, he escaped. They sewed him up in a canvas bag, and he escaped. They locked him in a milk can, and he escaped. They sealed him in a beer barrel, and he escaped. They put him in a maximum security prison, and old Harry, he got out. But then on October 1926, old man death laid his hand upon Harry Houdini, put him in a grave, and he has yet to escape. As a matter of fact, he told his wife, is there any way that I can find out, I will do it, and I will come to you. And if there's any way out, I will contact you on the anniversary of my death. For 10 years, she kept a light burning over Harry's portrait. At the end of 10 years, she turned the light out. Death had Harry, and Harry could not escape. Harry Houdini died. He was buried. He is still in the grave. It is a legal, historical, documented fact. Death also laid his hand on the Lord Jesus Christ. And death put Jesus in a rock-hued borrowed tomb. And that was a stone placed upon the mouth of that tomb in the seal of the Roman government. The demons and the devil himself thought they had, old, had Jesus defeated. And on the first day I can hear the grave as it calls down to hell. Said, hell, do you still have Jesus down there? Hell answered, says, yes, we've got him down here. We've got him locked up so tight, there is no way he could ever escape. And on the second day, the grave called down to hell, said, hell, do you still, do you still have Jesus down there? And hell called back, says, don't worry, don't sweat it. We've got him. He's locked up. There is no way he could ever get out. But on the third day, early in the morning, Jesus stirred himself, and the Holy Ghost stormed the gates of hell. He walked over to where Jesus was held 
in the throes of death. <laughs> he breathed into him the eternal spirit. And up from the grave he arose. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Death laid his hands on Harry Houdini. And Harry, he could not escape. Death laid his hands on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was impossible for death to hold him. When God's eternal time clock reached its precise moment, he came out of that prison of death. Up from the grave he arose, the mighty conqueror of his foes. He arose from the dead in the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Another ma man wrote a song recently and said, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me, he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives. Within my heart. Stand it, let's sing it. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me, he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Hallelujah. Is that your testimony? Go and give him an ovation. Praise God. He's alive. Jesus Christ is alive. He's not behind us. You may be sitting in a bar or tomb, but he is sitting before for us on a throne as the ruling, reigning, resurrected monarch of all the universe. Hallelujah. Now, the early church, they preached the cross. And then they preached the resurrection. Paul said, the preaching of the cross, it is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us that are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. Maybe you've never experienced it, but you've heard the Spirit call you. You felt him draw you. I know that because you're here today in the house of God. Jesus is alive. He is the Savior. And he wants to save any and every person. For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works. You can't work your way in. You can't make yourself good enough. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. But we're saved by God's amazing grace, and it's God's grace, God's favor. By grace are you saved through faith. That's not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Thank God for crying babies. There's one that didn't get a board. He's going to praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Boy, I'm glad that one didn't. Amen. I'm glad that when none of them get aborted. Amen. God is life. And Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But I want you to listen to what Paul, this preacher of the cross and the preacher of the gospel, said. 1 Corinthians 15 and 7, he said, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you are yet in your sins. Paul mentions an unthinkable thing here. Suppose there is no Easter. Suppose, just suppose for a moment, there is no resurrection. Suppose Jesus Christ is still in the grave. Paul said, if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. It is empty. It is nothing. Paul said, if Christ be not raised, you are still in your sins. Paul said, if Christ is still in the grave, you are trusting in something that does not deserve your trust. 
See, it's not enough to believe that Jesus died for your sins. If he did not rise from the dead, then your faith is useless because only a living Savior can save a dying world. And that's the difference between Jesus Christ and other religious leaders. Jesus rose from the dead. As Pastor Ricky said, Mohammed is still in the grave. Confucius is still in the grave. Buddha is still in the grave. Joseph Smith is still in the grave. These men lived, they died, they are still dead, and it is a legal, documented, historical fact. These other religious leaders and religions, they celebrate the death of their leader. Christianity, it is the only, and I don't even like to call it a religion, because I don't have religion. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's another big difference. It's not religion that saves you. It's blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. Because my blood was contaminated. I was contaminated with sin. My life was a wreck. I'd had some hard blows. But let me tell you something. When that nail-scarred hand touched me, I came out of darkness into the marvelous light. And glory to God, I've been so happy ever since then. I've had my battles. I've had my share. I've been shot at. I've been cut at. I've been cut on. I, I've been lied on. If you can think about it, it's happened to me. But I stand here today full of joy, full of peace, full of the righteousness of God because Jesus Christ imputed it to me. He saved my lost, dying soul. Praise God. Gave me joy unspeakable that's full of glory. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I feel a shout coming on. I can shout and I can dance. Praise God because he's alive. And guess what? He's living inside of me. He's living inside of you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad to be saved today? Glory. Glory, glory. Jesus is alive. He died. He rose again. And he holds the keys. And Easter is the proof. Now, the Bible talks to us about how you can be saved. And when you look at an audience this size, there are people here that are not saved. There are people here that you have never fully surrendered. You might have gone to church and said a few words, but no man can come to the Father unless the Spirit of God draws him. That's why you need to be where the Spirit of God is moving. See, this is a living, powerful, penetrating word. But if you read it, And God is talking to you because somebody prayed for you. Guess what? You can get saved. If you read it and you've heard it preached from someone that's full of the life of God, and this word is full of life, then you can get saved. This is the word of God. It is living. It is powerful. And guess who the word is? His name is Jesus. John said, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And guess what? God created man, Jesus Christ. He's the one that did it. He created all things. And he breathed into man the breath of life. And that was God's way of saying, you will always be attached to me. No matter how far you go away from me, no matter how deep down You go into sin. There's no way you can get away from my spirit. The psalmist said, where shall I go from thy spirit? Where shall I flee from thy presence? If I take the wings of the morning and sail to the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand find me. He said, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. He is the everlasting God, the everlasting Lord of glory. He is the Savior, and he wants to save people today. How can you be saved from your sin? How can you be saved from an eternity in hell separated from God? Listen to this. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Peter preached and said, Neither is our salvation in none of the name given among men under heaven, whereby you must be saved except for the name of Jesus. Paul preached and said, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, shall believe in thy heart 
that God raised him from the dead, that shall be saved. But with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You got to believe not in your head, but you got to be pricked in your heart by the Holy Ghost. And you got to hear him call and say, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh, life can deal you some tough things, some hard blows, and life has its, its share of troubles and and the Bible says, man that is born of woman is few of days and full of troubles. But I found out the one who can answer all the troubles of life, his name is Jesus. He loves you, and he gave his life on the cross for you. And today he rules and he reigns, and he wants to reign in your heart. And only a living Savior can save a dying world. If there is no empty tomb, then sin is sovereign. Think about that. And we've all sinned. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul said, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you are yet in your sins. What does that mean? That means that if Jesus Christ is still in the grave, that God did not accept his death as payment for our sins. The only positive proof that your sins were paid for by Jesus Christ is the fact that God raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. And if Christ be not raised, we're all still in our sins. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I wouldn't give you a half a hallelujah for the hope of glory. That he died for you is not important unless Jesus Christ rose from the dead. No resurrection, no Savior. No Savior, no forgiveness. No forgiveness, no justification. No justification, no cleansing. No cleansing, no hope. And we are all still in our sin. If the penalty of sin is still upon you, you are destined for an eternity. Oh, God. It, it, it makes me ache to say it. If the penalty of sin is still upon you, you are destined for an eternity in the flames of hell. If Jesus Christ is still in the grave, then death has dominion. If Christ be not raised, think about it. Then your family members who died trusting Jesus Christ, they have all perished. Your granddaddy, your grandmother, your father, your mother, your loved ones, they're dead and gone if Christ be not raised. If Christ be not raised, think about it. You will never see your loved ones again. If Christ be not raised, they are in the grave to rot and to decay. And it's all over. It's ended. Death is won. And life is but a bad dream. Shakespeare penned the words, out, out, brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage. And then it is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot. There's no resurrection. There is no life beyond the grave. Thank God. I'm not an idiot. I'm not. I can read. I grew up in the church. Mother and daddy prayed for me. When I was in combat, I wasn't a Christian. But mother and daddy were on praying terms. That was a church. <laughs> Woo! And the church was praying for me. And God was merciful. And God was gracious. And God spared my life. God is a good God. Hallelujah. Am I supposed to believe that death is a monster that has dominion? No, I cannot believe that. Winter is always followed by the springtime. The very seasons of the year, they tell me there is a resurrection. And listen to this. Paul said, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And because Jesus is alive, sin has been subdued and death has been defeated. See, Jesus has taken the sting out of sin. He has taken the gloom out of the grave. He has given us a hope that is steadfast. And sure. You know, I, I never was a gambler. I wanted something that was sure. I, I can remember getting paid 
on payday when I was in the Marine Corps. And they'd break out the cards, and these guys, they'd just be playing. And pretty soon before the sun went down, they were broke. I wouldn't gamble with them. I wanted something sure. And they'd come to me, can I borrow $20? Where's your money? I gambled. I lost it. Don't gamble when it comes to your soul. I can tell you something today that is steadfast and sure. And the Bible says it's appointed unto man but once to die. And that's not the end. Jesus died. He was buried. But death couldn't hold him. On the third day, woo, early in the morning, he rose. Glory to God. Victorious. Ain't no grave going to hold this body down. Ain't no grave going to hold this body down. I'm going to come up too. And everybody that has this hope in them, they're coming up out of that grave. Why? Because we got resurrection power, and we got it now. Glory to God. We uh, have what Jesus paid for. Thank God I don't have to wait for the sweet by and by. I'm looking forward to heaven. I'm looking forward to seeing my mother and my brother and, and, and my daddy and little Bubba that live with us. I, I've got some friends that have gone on. Some of you, I know your mind is going to grandmother. What a wonderful Christian she was. She can't get saved for you. She cannot. My daddy couldn't get saved for me. My mother couldn't get saved for me, but they prayed for me. Oh, I'm so glad they did. If you're sitting here today and if you're born again, somebody. Praise. And God honest prayer. And the greatest prayer you could ever pray is the prayer of surrender. Well, you come to the Lord Jesus Christ on a beautiful day like this, where people are celebrating the resurrection. Where people are celebrating what Christ has done in their lives. And you can come, you can kneel at the cross, and because you've heard the gospel and you believe it, in your heart, and you say, Jesus, come into my heart, wash my sins away, cleanse me from all sin, I give my heart, my life, and my future to you. And if you pray that prayer, Mean it from your heart. Confess it with your mouth. You're in a good place to get saved, to get born again of God's Spirit. Millions upon millions of people have prayed that prayer. And millions upon millions of people have been saved as a result of the prayer. The fact that that Jesus rose from the dead is not enough. There's going to come a day that we all must face that grim reaper called death. But Jesus has taken the sting out of sin. He's taken the gloom out of the grave. And we have resurrection power. And when he comes for his church, we're going to be with him forever ever and ever. I see so many people they're hurting, they're crying, they're sighing, and they're dying. And Jesus stands with open arms as you saw. Cameron, come up here, buddy. He was the man on the cross. Just put your arms outstretched on that cross. Those are arms open wide. Yes. And that's God's way of saying, I accept you. Yes. Just the way you are. With all your brokenness. With all that life has done to you. I accept you. Come unto me. And you can find life everlasting in the 
more abundant life here on earth. Let us stand. Thank you, Brett. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound see Amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet. God's goodness and mercy is calling you right now. These altars are open. If you want to make that bold step, say, I'm coming, Lord. I've heard you today. I believe. But I need a Savior, and I'm coming to you, Lord. I'm not coming to the preacher. I'm coming to Jesus. Hallelujah. Amazing grace again. First call is for souls, for people to be born again. But I want my prayer team to come, our prayer team here at Westmoreland. I want you to come and line up. There are some people here that have physical need, family need, and I've got some fresh oil. I fill all my vials up. These vials of oil have been prayed over. And uh, consecrated for the healing of people. And if you have a need today, I want you to come and let these people pray for you. You don't need to leave here like you came. Amazing grace. Amazing We've got all kinds of miracles in this house. Robert? Come on up, get another shot. Robert's been battling cancer. Got a good report from the doctor. Give the Lord a clap for him. Doesn't he look good? Hallelujah. If you're here, if you came in on a cane, come on up here. We got them coming in wheelchairs, and they're walking now. Got rid of the cane, got rid of the wheelchair. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If you got a family. That needs to be saved. Lost loved ones, come on up and let them pray for you. Somebody prayed for me. We're not having a service tonight because we want families to be with families. God designed the family. God loves the family. So we want you to have plenty of time with your family. So we're taking these moments here this morning so you can come and be prayed for. So you can be healed. So you don't have to suffer. The only slaughter of the enemy. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. 